Hello, the topic of this screencast is energy. And in the lesson this week, you're studying some of the energy reaction changes that go on in the body, how energy is stored, uh, what kinds of things does the body use energy for. And I think the thing that's missing is some background to that. Where does the energy come from? Um, how do we get it? How do other organisms get energy and use energy as well? Uh, there's kind of a misconception, I think, just reading about ATP in the text that energy somehow is created for use or it's made for use by certain reactions. And that is a major misunderstanding. We don't create energy. All the energy that comes into our bodies comes from the food that we eat and ultimately comes from the sun. And so, let's look at this diagram for a minute. Solar energy strikes the Earth. Photons of light are captured by the producers, by organisms like green plants and by photosynthetic proteins. And that, those photons of light energy are fixed in chemical bonds in organic molecules by photosynthesis. Now the plants and the photosynthetic proteins have a use for that energy. That energy is used in their cells to keep their bodies alive. In their cells they have to transport materials. They have chemical reactions going on. Uh, they have mechanical things going on like movement. Plants sometimes move. Uh, they orient toward the sun sometimes. That involves movement and, and uh, energy used by the cells to do that orientation. Uh, photosynthetic proteins. Let me switch this. Look at this little guy. This is a, a euglena. E-U-G-L-E-N-A. And it's a little photosynthetic protein. It's a single cell. Look at this. It has a flagellum out the back and it whips that flagellum back and forth and moves through the water of a pond or a stream. The neat thing about the euglena is that it also is packed with chloroplasts. All that green that you see is chloroplast material. So here's a little single-celled organism that moves like an animal, but it has chloroplasts inside of itself and it can make its own food. So the energy that uh, photons of light that hit a euglena by photosynthesis, fix that energy into organic compounds. And then that euglena in mitochondria, in its cell also, use that energy and convert it into usable forms that can transport materials, that can whip that flagellum around, and that can do chemical work. So, the plants um, and photosynthetic proteins use some of the energy that they are fixing from the sun to carry out activities in their body and then some of that energy is lost as heat. But those plants and photosynthetic proteins are eaten by the herbivores, by the first order consumers. And those organisms get chemical bond energy that's in that food that they're eating when they eat the plant or they eat the photosynthetic proteins. And they use that energy for their body activities. Some of the energy is lost as heat. They are in turn eaten by carnivores that use the chemical energy that's in the organic food of the bodies of the herbivores for their body activities and energy is lost as heat. From all of, these or, all of these organisms excrete wastes, and energy is lost. When they die, these organisms decompose, energy is lost again, and that energy cycles in the biosphere uh, again. It just isn't lost, it is recycled. So there's energy found at each of the levels in a food chain or a food web, in the ecosystems that we're a part of. And one of the interesting things that I've kind of alluded to 
is that as energy passes from one organism to another, a lot of it is lost. And kind of the rule of thumb is that only about 10% of the energy from one level of the food chain is available to the next level. So if there's about a million joules of sunlight that hits the plants, then the primary producers, then there's only going to be about a thousand, about 10,000 joules actually picked up by those plants. And only a thousand joules by the primary consumers is available. The secondary consumers maybe get a hundred. A snake up here, tertiary consumer, maybe only gets ten. So energy passes through this food chain, uh, but most of it is lost as it goes from one level to another. Well, what does that have to do with us? Well, we're up here. We're pretty high-level consumers. Actually, we operate on almost any level. When you eat plant material, you're a herbivore or you're a primary consumer. Um, and you can think of situations where you eat different kinds of things and are somewhere in here. If you're considering uh, eating low on the food chain and um, having as much energy available for everybody on the planet to eat, then we eat down at this level. It's much more consumptive to eat up here at this level. What does this have to do with all the energy that's in our body and how it supplies us with what we need to carry out activities? So let's start right here on this diagram. And this diagram is in Campbell also, or something that looks very much like it. But I, I want you to look at this part right here. We get our energy from food. So the food that we eat, whether it's plant material, whether it's a whole bunch of euglena in a, in a euglena stew, um, or whether it's a, a, a mousse that might be higher on the food chain. We get all our energy coming in. But we don't use it all at once, do we? We, we, we have to store it. Um, if we couldn't store energy that comes in, then every time you would eat a meal, you'd have this big flash of energy, and then it would be gone, and you wouldn't get any more until you ate again. But fortunately, there has evolved with living systems a molecule called ATP, adenosine triphosphate, that um, is responsible for storing the energy. And the energy is stored in the chemical bonds between some phosphate groups. So here are the phosphate groups. So the molecule ATP stands for adenosine triphosphate, it's an adenine molecule that is composed of an adenosine, that is an adenine molecule and a ribose sugar. Uh, probably in the book there's a more complex diagram showing the molecular structure of adenine also. So there's an adenosine base and there's one, two, three phosphate groups. Then the bonds between the phosphates represent the energy that is being stored. So you eat food, we'll talk about respiration in another chapter. At the end of respiration, ATP is made and that's the currency, that's the bank account for energy. When your body needs energy to do something, it gets that energy from ATP. And specifically, it hydrolyzes, a hydrolysis reaction occurs that splits off this terminal phosphate. The, the electrons that are being shared by these two molecules are not shared really strongly. And it's pretty easy to break this bond right here. And so that bond represents a lot of, a lot of energy that's pretty easy to get to. When that terminal phosphate is broken off, that phosphate representing energy goes to do something. Energy for cell work. And there are three kinds of work that the cell has to do. There is mechanical work, like movement, like actin and myosin operating in the muscle cells to contract and move your limbs. There's chemical energy. You're reading about enzyme action. And all those enzyme reactions that take place need energy. It takes energy for a substrate to bond into a binding site of an enzyme and for that bond to be broken or to put bonds together. 
So that is an example of chemical energy. And then you've already studied the cell membrane and about how things are brought in and out down a gradient uh, through a transporter molecule like a protein. And so transporting things across membranes takes energy also. So there's mechanical energy, chemical energy, and transport energy work that the cell uses this energy for. That phosphate is now available to be attached to something else, to build up a bond again. But when that phosphate is lost, you no longer have adenosine triphosphate, you now have adenosine diphosphate, ADP. So there's the adenine molecule again, there's one phosphate, there's two phosphates. Well, kind of the cool thing about the way this all works is that this phosphate that was taken off of the ADP up here can be reattached to the ADP over here and build up ATP again. But that's not a spontaneous reaction. It doesn't just happen automatically. You have to add energy. So the en some of the energy that we get from food, again, by respiration reactions in mitochondria, is used to attach that inorganic phosphate back onto ADP to make more AD ATP. So energy comes from somewhere, and energy goes to do something. There's nowhere in this picture, look at this, there's no place in this picture where energy is created, where energy is made, where energy is generated. So watch that in, in how you say something in, in an essay or in a lab about energy. Don't, don't think it's made or it's created. Energy is always somewhere. Energy is either in the food that we're going to eat or the energy is being used for something. I hope that's clear. As always, if I've said something that's just confused you more, uh, please send me a message. I'd be glad to explain it to you in a little more detail in your own private message. See ya.